So we just got done interviewing John McMurray. Yes. And John yes. is a photographer, leader of the Open Table Conference. Father, husband, theologian. Yeah, we, we talked about all kinds of different Author. things. Yeah, he, he's got a book. We talked about George MacDonald and we uh, talked Car- music. Carl Barth, music, movies. What I love about John is that everything boils down to relationship. Yep. Everything he had to say, whether it was on the subject of hell or it was the subject of scripture, uh, or, or the nature of God, it all boiled down to relationship. To, to relationship, yeah. So and uh, so, I I just was grateful for him. It was a, a lengthy conversation, mm-hmm. so probably a two-parter. Yeah. And um, but I think it'll be a great blessing and a great encouragement. Also, John uh, is the guy who runs Open Table Conference. So we encourage you guys to check them out. They um, probably the easiest thing to do is to go to their Facebook page, Open Table Conference, but they also have a website. Because of COVID, obviously, they're not able to have meet face to face, so they're going to have essentially a virtual conference. Yeah. And even if you can't be there for that day, all of it's going to be recorded and you'll be able to keep all of it as yep. long as you pay for the conference. And yep. I looked at the pricing, it's, it's like. And who's going to be there? Uh, the Zons. Uh, Brad Jerzak, yeah, yeah. Kenneth Tanner, Katie Surjak, uh, Paul Young. Did you say Paul Young already? Yep. Uh, Baxter Kruger. Baxter Kruger. So all these guys. It's a, a lot of the folks that we've gotten to talk to. Um, highly recommend looking that up. One other thing that's crazy. Ten years ago, oh, this yeah. was the craziest thing. Ten years ago, my first book that ever came out was a book I wrote for Donald Miller. It was a part two to a series called The Open Table. Mm. And... Uh, so what was crazy is he's talking, he tells us his story and he talks about how he was friends with this guy named Donald Miller and he's working on a book. And I'm like, oh my goodness, did you write the first book? Yeah, you wrote mm. the first book. So so we had this connection from 10 years ago where we'd worked on the same project. That's crazy. But just never met each other. Yeah, it was crazy. It's a small world and fun how God keeps connecting the dots. Mm. Hey, also guys, we're getting started. So we would really value if you guys uh, left reviews. So the way this more people can hear about the podcast is if you give us five stars or if you think we're terrible give us one star however many stars you want to give us is helpful because it, it tells others about the podcast and then um did you also, say give us one star <laughs> i mean if they want to if they want to give us one if they think the content were is one star material <laughs> then you go for it but any kind of star would be great and also uh, five is best if though. you leave reviews uh, that would be that would be great because the the more stars or reviews we get, the more people will get to hear about us. Yep. So yep. thank you guys so much for your support and your encouragement. Yeah. And anyway, you guys are going to greatly enjoy this. Be fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. It's incredible to meet you, man. Thanks. Thanks. Great to meet you guys. Jonathan had nothing but great things to say about you guys. <laughs> and, and, and you've had most of the usual suspects on so you know it's my tribe now so and that a, isn't that a crazy thing i grew up uh in the church uh yeah. and and actually lots of different flavors because we moved all over the u.s and canada okay um but but primarily charismatic and pentecostal mm-hmm. and have always found places with belonging and 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 connection but uh, in the last year, I feel like I've found where I actually fit. I've never quite fit is what I'm trying to say. Mm. <laughs> Just that non-conformity, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly <laughs> you, what I'm talking about. You would have been great back in the 60s. <laughs> you, 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 missed, you missed your decade. <laughs> I did. I missed my decade. Uh, well, John, one of the things we do to start off is we do kind of a rapid fire Okay. Um, you mean you're not going to offer me tacos? <laughs> <laughs> so it's Sorry, so we'll I ask, I get tacos delivered. <laughs> I'm kidding. We'll uh, we'll ask you a, a set of questions. But talking about tacos, do you have a, a favorite taco? Yeah, I, I have a favorite taco place, um, and I'll get street tacos there. But my favorite thing there is nachos. Actually, it's a place called mm, okay. the Matador. All right, that's legal. <laughs> yeah, and they they actually started as a tequila bar before they started serving a lot of food. Mm. 
and they have what they call Top Shelf Tuesday. So if, ah. you, if you order a tequila that's, um, I, I believe it's 12 or 16, if it's over that amount, it's half off. <laughs> so Tuesdays are a great time to go. Although I, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been since the quarantine thing. I'm kind of craving. We just so. did uh, uh, a few days ago. We just saw some good friends. We finally went, our taco place is open. Oh, awesome. And, and so we did. We had a margarita and some tacos. Oh, man, it was wonderful. What about a favorite? Do you have a favorite movie or a favorite TV show? Are you a oh, film man. guy? Yes, very much. Uh, I get all my theology from SpongeBob. <laughs> um, that, that's because I watched that with my kids growing up for years. But It is the best show. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's kind of, it reminds me of Bugs Bunny. Like the kids love the animation, but they don't get half the jokes. That's right. And, and, and Bugs Bunny had humor that no child would ever get. It, it's, it was awesome. Um, yeah. And being, being that I grew up on the East Coast, that whole sarcasm thing, that's very, <laughs> very much Philadelphia, which is where I. Oh, yeah. Up, so. That's the love language of our house. We call yeah. it sarcasm is our love language. <laughs> No, that wouldn't fly in Portland. They, they'd, all, they'd all get hurt feelings and wonder, what, wonder what's wrong with you. So, but um, yeah, it's hard to pin down a favorite movie or a favorite TV series. I know this is going to sound bad, but my favorite TV series would be either Breaking Bad. Nice. Um, that or Game of Thrones. I'm not promoting nudity and all that stuff, but, but they, were, they were really great. And well written, well acted yeah, shows. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll never forget the opening scene for Breaking Bad. It had me hooked right at the beginning. Oh so. my goodness, amazing! And 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 uh, George R. R. Martin. I wrote. I I was reading those books twenty years ago. Oh really? really? Trying to tell people how amazing the series is. So yeah, when oh. it came out, uh, are you oh, happy cool. with how it ended? Just while we're here? No. No. Who is? It was disappointing, <laughs> no. wasn't it? Yeah. You spent you spend whatever amount of years you know, Invested. developing all of these characters and plots. Yeah. Yeah. And then you try to tie it up all in a few minutes. I know, really, disappointing. It was disappointing, but <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Awesome. Any, any other rapid fire questions? We normally, we normally ask uh, like a book you're currently reading or a, a really influential person in, in your life. Okay. Um, actually several books I'm reading. Uh, but the one I was reading this morning is um, Pete Townsend's autobiography. <laughs> um, I, I, they would probably be, if not my favorite all-time band in the top three. Man, we, we should be friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, we'll just pursue it, right? That's but, right. Um, for those who don't know, Pete Townsend was kind of the lead man, guitar player, singer, songwriter for the band The Who. Um, yeah. And they, they were in their heyday, uh, late 60s and yeah. the 70s, really so, yeah. which was when I was in high school and college. And, but then I went into the Christian thing and I broke all my records. <laughs> and you know, finally I go, I can't live without Live at Leeds, so I went out and got it again so so my first year in bible college i would go to the dumpster regularly because kids would be throwing out their cds <laughs> <laughs> and i compiled the best oh, the gosh. best uh, collection of music so obviously I, even in bible college i wasn't that religious but i i compiled <laughs> the best but the hardest part of that was that when they would visit your dorm room <laughs> <laughs> they would look at you get your judged. CDs. You get judged. <laughs> well, not just that. They would look at your CDs, and one of their CDs was on the shelf because <laughs> I pulled it out of the garbage. Right. But, uh, okay. This I'll tell you this really oh, quick geez. story. Yeah. So I'm a I'm a senior in high school, and that summer before my senior year was a, a pretty significant turning point in my life. It's when I decided that I was going to be serious about my faith, which I had not wanted to have anything to do with it pretty much my entire life. Again, you're talking early seventies. So I was a pot smoking laid back. I mean, it's just, that's just was the culture. Yeah, and sure, yeah, yeah. so when I got, when I got serious about my faith, 
you know, like, like a lot of things just kind of happened. But one of the things that was hard for me to deal with was the whole music thing. Because I love music. And I'll never forget taking my three favorite albums at the time. <clears throat> it was Led Zeppelin II, which has Heartbreaker, a whole lot of love. Yeah. That one. The Who, Live at Leeds, which I think mm. is the greatest live album ever. And Wheels of Fire by Cream, which was okay. one live album and one studio album. Oh, cool which was Eric Clapton at his best. And I lined them up on the back wall of my house and I got rocks and I threw them until oh, I, oh, yeah. Oh, oh man. This vinyl, is... vinyl, man. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, and you so, could hear even, even the angels were weeping. <laughs> no, no. I think Jesus was weeping. Like, yes. so, <laughs> but you know, not quite as bad as when he wept with Lazarus, but probably not. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's a good place to start then, man. Yeah. We're rethinking God, right? That's, yep. Uh, yep. and I, I saw a phrase that you said that uh, I'm just going to quote it, but I keep thinking that God is better than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the gospel. And that's been my life story is I grew up in the church with these beautiful encounters with God, but also these very, very flawed ideas about God. And they were in conflict all the time. So part of our passion is this, this rethinking, this thing where he's always better than I think he is, better than my ability to even grasp. And so tell us, tell us how, you, how this started for you, your story. Yeah, um, I've lived a lot of years, so <laughs> try and shorten this. My parents had a conversion experience when they were adults in their 30s. And my dad had been a pretty hard party animal type guy. I have pictures of him when he was a younger man with just a table covered with bottles of beer and wine and alcohol. And yeah. And uh, anyway, so when he, when he had this conversion experience or, you know, I like to think of it when he actually began to listen to Jesus mm -hmm. uh, in his life and began to trust him, uh, it was pretty dramatic. And so he already was, and I'm not going to go deep into it, but my dad has is had issues. We all do. One of his was control, but this exacerbated that because now he didn't want his kids to make the mistakes he had made. Right. He didn't want us to go wild. So he became super strict with religion. So we were, you know, I grew up in, an, okay. We weren't even evangelical. We were fundamental. Yes. Okay? So <laughs> okay. we were, we were fundamentalists. Um, this was before evangelical, I think was even a word. <laughs> but um, point is, is, he was pretty strict. I grew up having to go to church, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, the whole thing all the time. And um, it's, it's not that I disliked it. it. It was just that this was what was my dad was making me do, so I didn't want to be there. Right. So I had nothing against God. It was really more between me and my dad. And God, he was using God as his enforcer. And I looked at God going, I'm not even interested in you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but my mom told me about Jesus and told me that Jesus loved me. And as far as I can tell, when I was a child, I believed her. I mean, what, yeah. what kid doesn't believe their mom when they're six years yeah, old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I believe I had the beginnings of responding to him in relationship, even that young. Mm -hmm. Um but I didn't want to have anything to do with official Christianity yeah. mm -hmm. until my senior year. And like I said, I had, uh, that's a long story in and of itself, but I, I had an experience. I went to a Christian camp and actually got busted and <laughs> they were going to send me home, which I knew would mean I would spend my senior year in chains and jail. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want that to happen. And they made me a deal and said, if, if you won't cause any trouble, we'll let you stay. And I was like, okay, anything's better than having to tell my dad that, right, you know, right. whatever. Right. So I did. And uh, that's where I decided I was going to be serious about my faith. And so that set me on a completely different trajectory. I ended up graduating from high school. I went to Bible college for four years. I graduated from Bible college. Um, I had looked at a lot of schools, decided I was going to come to Portland, came here to go to grad school because I was interested in teaching. So 
uh, I did that. I graduated and I got an opportunity to teach at the Bible college that I attended. They asked me to come back and teach. And by this time, it's almost 10 years later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they asked me to come back. And I'm mm-hmm. like, how did you even find me? <laughs> so, right. Um, wow. Anyway, so I did. And I ended up doing that for a couple of years. And then I ended up leaving and going into working in a church for a couple of years. And I was telling Thomas that it was during that time that uh, I just really had an increasing sense of um, Christian ministry as a vocation wasn't necessarily for me. And I decided to become a nature photographer. So that's, that's what I ended up doing as a vocation. But it also, one of the reasons I, I even tried to do that route was because I knew it would give me the opportunity to still um, be involved in people's lives and teach and just help people come to know Jesus. Cause I still cared about that. And I, I it just wasn't getting paid for it, which brings a real freedom because, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're sitting in your living room and, and I, I, for years, I worked with college age people and, you know, you'd have 20 college kids or whatever in your living room and they'd ask a question and you'd say something they couldn't say, well, you're supposed to say that because you're the pastor. Mm. They can't say that to me. It's like, no, yeah. dude, I, I'm not the pastor. Yeah. I'm saying this to you because I actually think it's real. I think right. it's true. Yeah. So that I love that freedom and I love that authenticity that it immediately gave me with, with people. It also, I think, uh, I was trying to say to, to, I think, to college people, look, if you want to, if you want to actually walk with Jesus, it doesn't mean you have to go to Bible college. It doesn't mean you have to go into ministry, which was kind of the thinking that I grew up with. So all of that, you know, I should sit down on a couch with a therapist and figure out and (laughs) sort that all out. Thomas, you can help me here. Anyway, um, all that to say, even for the past three decades that I've been a photographer, more than three decades now, um, I taught part time at a Bible college for 12 plus years and taught the college group. I preached in church. I just did a lot of teaching. Right. I was completely and firmly and solidly bound to the evangelical framework. That was my question. Mm-hmm. What were right? you teaching? I was, yeah. I was a poster boy. Unlike you, I was not charismatic or Pentecostal background. And so for me, it was even more exclusively the Bible, like the only way God communicates to you, unless it's this really weird exception, um, is the Bible. So for me, studying the Bible was paramount Mm -hmm. and trying to understand what God is saying was the most important thing you could do with your life. So I was firmly entrenched in that. And like you, Jason, what you were saying I lived in this tension of I had experienced in many ways, the love of God in my life. Right. I knew that. I don't, I don't think I ever doubted that. There were a lot of things I doubted, but i never doubted that I had experienced the love of Jesus in my life. Right. But I had this theology yeah. that was, that was toxic. Yeah. And so it held me in tension because where the theology was taking me, which is what I followed was to a God who was a monster. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So he wasn't better than I thought he was. Yeah. So I have a friend that used to say it this way. Like she said, I struggle with reading books like the Chronicles of Narnia or the shack or some others, because then I come back to my theology and reality isn't as good. Yeah. What they describe in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I knew exactly what she was saying when she said, because that was, that was my life. The journey out of that, again, uh, that's, a, that's a much longer one, but I'll try and make that brief. I, was, uh, I am uh, friends with Donald Miller. He lived with us for four years in our home. Yeah, yeah. Family. And uh, he had asked me to work on a book project with him, basically kind of doing the research. And it was a project that involved uh, t- looking at the life of Jesus out of the Gospel of John. Well, there were a bunch it, of reasons why, but... Was, was this called The Open Table? Yes, it was. Do you know that I wrote the second 
You wrote the second one? Yeah. No way. Yeah. How did you, how, did, oh, okay. We got to do that off, off yeah. record here. I got to <laughs> anyway, do that story. All this time I've been like, you know, I, did, I told him at one point, I'm like, the open table, you know that there's like this whole thing with Donald Miller from 10 years ago that I wrote the second, and I never once thought, thought they were connected. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yep. No, that's okay. Well, I also took the metaphor further than, than Don did. Yeah. You know, to Don, it was an open table in that, you know, there's a seat for everyone. Everyone belongs here and it's open, it's safe, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. All that's true, but it's also, this isn't my table. This mm, is yeah. wow. the Trinity's table. Wow. Right? wow. This is, this is Rube Love's icon. This is the, this is the seat mm. at the table that we all have in Jesus. Wow. wow. So that first book that I, that I was doing with Don there were so many delays to it. I ended, up, I ended up researching or studying in the Gospel of John. The best I can tell, because I can't remember exactly, but I know it was at least seven years. It may have been as wow. much as eight, eight and a half years. Wow. That I, I'm spending all of my time, other than the classes I had to teach, in John. Wow. And That's that a good place to spend your time, man. Yeah. It began, <laughs> it, and, and it wasn't like I hadn't read John before. I had. A lot. Yeah. I, yeah. It, was my, it was my favorite of the Gospels, mm. but you know that much time in it. Um, this is my imagination. You know, the Father, Son, and Spirit have this conversation. Well, he won't get his nose out of John, so maybe we should meet him there, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I and don't get don't take this wrong, but I feel like the way God loves us is if you won't get your nose out of Playboy, then he'll meet you I there. Mean, that's so profound. Right? He will meet us where we are. Amen. Exactly. He doesn't yeah. care where you are or what you're doing. He loves that's you. And he's going to meet you yeah. there. Yeah. That's because good. he is there already. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like I'm absent. It's like, no, I'm here. I'm trying to wake you up to the fact yeah. that I am. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's good. Anyway, so that was happening. And in 2007, uh, I started this thing called Northwest School of Theology. And we did our first one. And actually, Donald was one of the people that taught at it. It was a lot of fun. And I came back from that, and I was teaching an adult Sunday school class, and a guy came up to me late September and said, have you read this book, The Shack? And I said, no. He says, well, it's a local guy, because I live outside of Portland, Oregon. Right, and right, yeah. At the time, Paul did too. Yeah. He's, he has since, a couple years ago, he moved across the river and went to Washington. He was a traitor, but um, <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm but he's, he's still, it's a suburb of Portland. It's just across yeah. the river. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, I said, no, I don't, I don't know him. I haven't heard of the book. He says, I think you'd like it. And I was like, okay. You know, and I told Thomas, I said, I went home, mowed the lawn or whatever. I don't remember, but right, I totally right. forgot about the conversation. Mm -hmm. The next week I go back to teach the, my last class with that class. And he comes back up afterwards with a book in hand and he hands it to me. And so I was going on a photographic trip the next day for about 10, 12 days. And I took it with me. And so I was in Moab, Utah, and I had done some photos at the sunrise and early morning and went back to bed, got up and went over to Moab Brewery and was going to have lunch at 11 in the morning. And I remembered, oh, that book. Because I had, you know, it was 11 in the morning. Nobody was in the restaurant but me and there was right. nothing to do. So I ran back out to the car, got the book and read the whole thing in the restaurant. Wow. wow. I left about 530 that night and wow. I cried several times uh, mm. in, right there in public, which is un was unusual for me. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I was reading and I was just like, yeah. 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 You know, it's just, right, um, right. because he was articulating things that I had struggled to put into words and things that, and other things that I hadn't thought about, but as soon as he said it, I went, yeah. So I come home from that trip and I did something I'd never done before at the, in the back of the book. Uh, he had his email. And so I wrote him and I said, Hey, you're local. You know, Donald Miller uh, he's a good friend of ours. Um, I'm local. I'd love to get together with. I really appreciated your take on the Trinity. And 15 minutes later, I got a phone call. And it's Paul Young. 
And this wow. was like, this was like 1030 in the morning. He said, what are you doing for lunch? He says, I'd love to get together. I said, you mean today? He goes, yeah, today. And <laughs> he says, I, uh, the only thing is it's got to be in an area of Portland called Clackamas. Uh, he says, cause that's where I work. I'm, he, he was still working three jobs because the book hadn't oh, taken yeah. off at all. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And uh, he, I told Thomas last night, he was selling them out of the trunk of his car. And <laughs> um, true story. So we met, he gave me a big hug. And the first thing I asked him, I said, I got, I got a million questions, but the first thing I want to ask you is I said, I, I realize this is a fiction story but it has a lot of theology in it. And he goes, yeah. And I said, you know, trying to write about and imagine what the relationship is like within the Godhead is obviously impossible, but you're, I, love, I love your take on it. So biblically speaking, because, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still an evangelical somewhat. Um, so that's the way you talk. <laughs> right? Biblically sure. Speaking, yes. Yes. Right? Biblically speaking. Uh -huh. um, you know, what shaped you to come up with this kind of scenario of what their interaction might be like? Oh, he's, that's easy. John 13 through 17. Well, I just mm. spent the yeah. last seven, eight years there. Yeah. And I yeah. went, I knew it. It had to be because I, yeah. I couldn't think of anything else in the Bible that where he would wow. get this from. And wow. so we just became good friends. And a few months later, he got a, he got a phone. Well, actually he got a phone call from a friend who had read the book because by this time it's like February of 2008 and the book is starting to take off. And yeah. this person read it, sent it to a guy, a, a theologian in Mississippi and said, you have to read this book. And, uh, he reads the book and I'll, he may have told you the story. I don't know if he told you the story. When no, he, he didn't. The book, uh, he absolutely fell in love with it. Well, this person calls Paul and says, you should call him. His name's Baxter Kruger. So Paul calls him. Baxter's like, you're calling me? Who? Like, how did you get my number? Like, wh how, why are you calling me? And right, Paul's right. like, well, you know. And anyway, so they end up doing a conference together. That's where I meet Baxter. And so then wow. the two of them, I invited to start teaching at at the Northwest School of Theology that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. And that's where our friendship began to develop and grow. And then about four years later, I started the open table. What's important about that is this, is that when I read The Shack, it set me on a trajectory to read people like the Torrance Brothers, um, Karl Barth, people you know, that I had read in seminary, but I only read them in seminary because they were being quoted and mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out how we answer that because we don't agree <laughs> right. with Karl Barth, right? right? But I'd never read him for myself. Heck, I had never even read Athanasius on the incarnation right. in the word of God. So yeah, that's another topic. But anyway, <laughs> um, so not only did they open up to me a conversation, but they gave me people that had been having this conversation all the way right. back to the early church. That's, that's a big part of it, yeah. Right? And so yeah. the early church is saying, this is what we understand the apostles to be saying. This is what we think yeah. they saw. This is what we think, yeah. this is what they taught us. Anyway, my friendship with them grew and, and we just uh, began reading and learning. So I didn't know where I was going, but I didn't care. Because right. all I knew is that God was better than I thought he was. And so right. no, there's no way I'm going back to where I was. Right, right. So I don't know where I'm going, but again, he's got this. I don't. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to follow this out. But I, I look back in my life in hindsight, and it's fun to see. I don't even know what to call them, you guys, but just little things in my life that I can see now that I didn't recognize at the time little markers, little memorials, yeah. little things where God was just like cracking open a door or letting right. the window open a little bit to let in some fresh air. But I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't connect dots. I didn't, yeah. you know, I was so entrenched in a, in not only a way or a perspective of seeing things, 
But the worst part of it was I was convinced that I was right. right. So, mm -hmm. so if you started to talk to me about certain things, I would be polite and listen to you. Sure. I wouldn't listen to you. Sure. The whole time I'm listening to you, I'm trying to figure yeah. out how do I answer you? An like, argument. How do I, yeah, how do I refute you? Yeah. How do I yeah, yeah. show yeah. you that what I believe is more yeah. correct than what you believe? Yeah. So uh, I guess the journey you could say started in, in earnest about 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and then it took this kind of giant leap out of a pond. Yeah. And when I, when I jumped out of the pond, I looked around and I went, oh my gosh, there are thousands of ponds. Mm. And I didn't even right. know there was any other pond. I only thought there was right. one. Right, sure, right? sure, yeah. And right. I'm in it. By pond, do you mean like? Uh, my theology, my perspective of truth. Yeah, right, exactly. My version, and my without... version of Christianity, just another religion. And so all, <laughs> if there's, yeah, just you're talking when you say there's all kinds of ponds, you're saying that there's all these closed perspectives and... Uh, is well, that what you're saying? Or well, some of them may not be as closed as others, but everybody in right. their pond thinks that they're in the right pond. That's right. Yeah. I've seen and, and when you get out of it and you, and if you, if you could, and I, I, I know this metaphor is going to break down at some point, but, but I, again, I imagine if you could get up, you know, in a little drone and look down, you'd see that all the ponds connect. Yeah. Mm. And what's connecting yeah. them is the father, son, and spirit. Yeah. Mm. It's yeah. not an, it's not an ideology. Yeah. Okay. It's the yeah. living it's a, God who's connecting because yes. we're all connected. There's only, yeah. there's only one human nature. He took that on and mm. he is that now because there is forever within the being of God, a human. Yeah. Right. The yeah. incarnation, it still exists. Yes. God is in flesh. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's in the very being in the very essence of God himself. Yeah. You know, the, the inner inner being of God. Hey guys, just a quick break to let you know that you can find Thomas and I on familystory.org. You can also sign up for the mailing list where we release weekly articles, a monthly message podcast, and then we keep you up to speed on any opportunities, teachings, uh, travels that we're doing. You guys can check out my Instagram page. I'm posting stuff on mental health, wholeness, inner healing. I also do a good amount of work with the Enneagram and I'm, I'm gonna be doing a couple of Facebook Lives here coming up. My Instagram handle is my first name, my middle initial and my last name. So that's Thomas F. Floyd. And mine is Jason Clark is. Jason Clark is. Yes, yes. Is what? Is there? <laughs> is whatever you need him to be. Jason Clark. Whatever you want him to be. Yeah, so go to familystory.org or check out our Instagram handles for more content and information. Bless you guys, we'll get back to this podcast. I use the parable of the sower mm -hmm. um, to, to articulate this, and I may have done this uh, with you before, I don't know. When the sower sows, he sows on all the soil, he sows everywhere, and he believes that the seed is, is powerful enough that the seed will eventually create soil that can bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And that is how I often will describe what he's like. He gets in the middle of wherever we're at. Mm -hmm. If we're a rocky path, that's okay. I believe in the power of, of seed. I'm going to sow there. For me, the foundational shift in my life was 15 years ago when I heard the phrase, Jesus is perfect theology. And that God is always good. The idea that he's always good has been the most transformational thing in my life. It continually draws me into places of trust, places of, of discovery, and, and places of, of becoming transformed. And, uh, and suddenly, like you said, you, you realize it's, it's way bigger than um, us and them. It's not even an us and them gospel. It's actually, I pray that you would be one. No, there is, there is no us and them. There's just us. There's just mm. us. I love That's it. it. That's it. And I'm sure that when, when you talked with Baxter last week, he talked, I'm sure, I have no doubt that he talked a lot about the fact as he sees it, and I agree, the entire human race is in Jesus. And yeah. He is yeah. in them. Yeah. Um, mm. Whether they know it, acknowledge it, care Amen. about it, or anything. It's not, it's, <laughs> my response is not the point in, yeah. in, mm. terms, in terms of the truth of it. My response yeah. is the point when it comes to my experience of it. That's right. it. Right? That's so, good. Um, but even the person who doesn't know it, doesn't believe it, they still experience it to some degree. I mean, and you remember the story in the Bible when 
Jesus says, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. They still experience the goodness yeah. of God. They just may not yeah. think it's coming from God or whatever they think. It doesn't matter, but they still experience it. If, if my neighbor who is whatever, pick a religion, pick a philosophy, it doesn't matter. If he loves his wife and his children, he's participating in the life of God. Yeah. Because he, yeah. mm. he didn't originate yeah. that love. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm. So yeah. if he's participating in it, which he is. That's good. This, this changes everything. It changes the way it you does. see the human race. It changes the way you see neighbor. This is why I evangelism. Say, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That Can word. That? You want to say that? <laughs> um, yeah. Like I have a lot of friends that are missionaries and yeah. we've had this conversation many, many times. It totally changes it on yeah. so many levels. The one that I, I think I enjoy the most is any conversation I have with any person. I don't care what they believe. I don't care what their culture That's or right. their background is. It doesn't matter because their belief does not save them. Their That's belief right. does not determine their destiny. Their belief <laughs> does not determine their relationship. So I'm having a conversation with someone that, number one, I believe Christ is in them. So I'm yes. going to try and find that point of meeting where they're listening to Jesus, whether they think it's Jesus or not, but they are. So good. Yeah. And and I can talk to them about that because I'm going to find a point of mm. contact there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that usually has to do with things like goodness and love and kindness, sacrifice. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd love to talk to all the frontline workers during the pandemic because yeah. they are participating in the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit of right. the human race. That's, yeah. Right. That's Whether they right. believe it yeah. or not. Whether they acknowledge yeah. it or not. So it, it just makes conversations so much more enjoyable because when I speak to them, no matter who it is, I have nothing to sell them. I have nothing yeah. to convert them to. Yeah. I have no agenda in my pocket. There's nothing <laughs> hidden, nor is it out front because I don't have yeah. one. The yeah. only thing I care about is how do I get to know you and embrace you and love you? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. How can I do that? You know, mm, cause yeah. I don't know. I don't know what speaks love to you until I get to know you. So yeah. How do, how do I do that? That's the conversation. Um, so good. That's good. You know, missions and evangelism, I'm all for it, but it depends on what you're doing. Anyway, so yeah. my journey took a, a, a quantum leap forward uh, after I read The Shack because yeah. it showed me there were other pawns. It showed me the connection. And then um, I just began reading like crazy. I, I mm. will, I, I'll tell you this story real quick. George McDonald is like the dude to me. <laughs> right. Now that's a reference to the big Lebowski. You asked me about movies. That's in the top, <laughs> that's in the, that's in the top 10. I, I, okay? I wondered so, if you knew what you were doing, but of course oh, you did. Oh man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so George is the dude, you know, he said things like God is always doing his best for every man. Like if you actually believe that, which I don't understand <laughs> how you could not believe that, so that you mean like, well, this guy over here, God's not going to do his best for him. He's going to kind of <laughs> give him a half ass effort or something. Or you know, what are we saying about God? Here, right. 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 What are, yeah. What, yeah. What are we claiming about the nature of God? Yeah. Um, but if God is oh, doing his it. best for every man all the time, oh my gosh, this just, again, it just changes the landscape of how I look at life and humanity and my purpose in it. So I had never read George until I got out of that pond because George in my pond, George was a universalist. So you right. don't read George. <laughs> right. Right. That, yeah. That's like yeah. saying, that's like saying to me, well, John, uh, you shoot film and I shoot digital. So I, I can't talk to you because you're a heretic. Right. Right. Mm. It's, right. yeah, it's a different yeah. perspective. That's all it is. Unless so you're I, in that pond. Yeah. And then it's everything. Yeah. Right. I do want to share this with you because I think this is pretty important to the journey. Um, and this is a little bit longer story. This will take about five minutes. But when I was in seminary, uh, I did my MA in Greek. So most of my classes were with Greek. You trying to understand it and learn it and all that. And the, my favorite class that I ever had was very uh, European. I remember the first day we walked into the class and there were nine of us. And the teacher, the prof, uh, had uh, five passages or six, I forget, on the whiteboard. 
And he said, okay, you guys, this is the class. Um, this is the first time we'll meet and we won't meet again until, and he gave a date. It was like three months later. And I said, I love this guy already. <laughs> right. So um, he said, but you're going to pick a passage. You're going to write a paper, a research paper on that passage. You know, he had it all in the syllabus, right? So, you know, you've got to work with the Greek language, blah, blah, blah. So they were obviously all New Testament passages. He said, and then you'll, in the past, I think the paper had to be a minimum of 30 pages or something like that, whatever it was. And then you're going to print them off. This is back before emails, you guys. This is back before anything like that. Mm. So you had to literally type everything out on paper and yeah. print it out, get yeah. copies. Yeah. But you're going to give everybody in the class a copy. Everybody reads it. And then the next week, you teach your paper to the class. I went, this is great. So I looked up on the board. I looked at the passages and one of them was John 17. Mm. And I said, I'm going to do John 17. <laughs> so, so I'm <clears throat> at that point in my life, I'm 20, 28 years old. Yeah. Two things that I discovered through that, through that paper. And you'll see, see why this is important because it, it, uh, it's the seeds to use to talk about your parable. Yeah. The first one was, when you look at the Gospel of John, you know, he's telling this story. And one of his favorite things he does is he uses what we call editorial comments, where he injects his viewpoint into it. Yeah. So, for example, when you read the, the account of the feeding of the 5,000, he says, you know, they were on this hill. It was green and grassy. And then it says, because it was the Passover time was near. Well, that's an editorial mm -hmm. comment. He's telling you when it was. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> He's not right. just describing something. He's not yeah. quoting a dialogue or a conversation, yeah. you know, whatever. So he does this everywhere. I mean, this is this in every chapter of John, you'll find just multiple dozens, probably. I've never counted them all, but you'll find editorial comments until you get to John 17. John 17, mm -hmm. there's not one. Oh, wow. Huh. Not one. Huh. It's a complete, it's a, compositionally if you're studying the bible as literature it's a complete departure literarily huh. for the for whoever's mm. writing this now i get that they're saying this is a this is a prayer of this person and he's simply quoting the prayer but before the prayer there's no editorial comment after the mm. prayer he immediately picks up the crucifixion narrative there's no comment mm. on the prayer wow and i just i stood there and i looked at that and i said okay this is this is bizarre the entire story is like this, and he departs from it. Why yeah. would he do that? So right. then I start, I start looking at what's in the prayer, and this, this, would, this was fun to me. The major themes of the prayer are also all in the prologue, which is John 1, 1 to 18. Mm. Right. Which the prologue is like John, the narrator, giving you a pair of glasses and saying, okay, before you start my story, put these on right. so you can right. see what I'm trying to say. Mm, that's right. the prologue. That's how it functions. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And all, all, of the, all of the themes of the prayer are in the prologue. Well, which came first? Did John hear Jesus pray? And so then when he writes the prologue, it informs right. the prologue? Or right. did he write the prayer down and then say, okay, now... My point is, is that it's the prayer that informs yeah. the prologue. And the yes. prologue yes. is what informs the whole story. The whole thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I discovered in my theory that John wow. 17 is literally the foundation of the whole narrative. Mm. Yes. So what's in wow. John 17? Well, here's how John 17 opens up. This is eternal life. Okay. <laughs> that sounds very much to me like what's coming, what's following is the definition. Yeah. In, in, in fact, it's the only place in all of Scripture, Old or New Testament, where you'll even get close to what a definition of eternal life is. Now, again, in wow. my evangelical <clears throat> background, eternal life is going sure. to heaven. Eternal life is sure. being mm -hmm. saved. These yeah. are all synonymous, right? Yeah. And he defines eternal life as a relationship. <laughs> my entire education had defined eternal life as believing the right ideology. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? Mm, yeah. So yeah. I discovered yeah. this at 28 years old. 
And <laughs> it's not until I'm 45 yeah. that the yeah. spirit connects the dots. Or oh, yeah, wow. that's, the wrong, that's the wrong way to say it. The dots had been connected. It took almost 20 years for me to recognize them, to see them. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Right? And wow. That, that's my journey. So wow. now what's so important about that? Well, it just redefined everything. So now everything, just like the Trinity redefines everything, you have to think about not just who God is and what he's like, that it's a relationship. So when, yeah. uh, you remember the book, Knowing God by J.I. Packer? Did you ever see yeah. that book? Okay, yeah. well, that was, that was a classic book back in the 70s. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. And I would read that book once a year because it had that much impact on me. J.I. Packer doesn't talk about the Trinity in that book. <laughs> and I'm not sure how, not. You can, how, how you can know God without talking about the Trinity. Yeah. And this is the way, if you look at every classical theology, they all look at the attributes of God or the characteristics of God as properties of character of an individual. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. God is a relationship. So any attribute or characteristic has to be describing a relationship, not an individual. Wow. That's good. That just changed so good. everything, right? Yeah. It changed everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. in the same way, if <laughs> eternal life is a relationship, which makes sense if God is a relationship, eternal life is yeah. a relationship, because yeah. he's life. He is yeah. life, right? And yeah. to be connected yeah. to him is life. To not be connected yeah. to him is death. Mm. But you can't not be connected to him. <laughs> so what you experience is the sensation of death and it's very real but it's not true but if you if you look at the whole bible and you look at all of our you know our all of our doctrines about the study of salvation you know and atonement right. theory you know soteriology or everything if you look at it as a relationship instead of yes okay so good. jason and thomas do you believe this? Do you, you know, do you right. believe this? Do you believe this? Right. And we take us right. through the four, seven, depending on who taught you, yeah. steps to that is... become a Christian. If you talk about it as a relationship, all of that just went away. Yeah. Right. That is so, so good. That's and I don't have an agenda. Yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, so when you started seeing things through that lens, or through that that relational dynamic, what were some of the other um, rethinkings rethinkings right? that, that that took yeah. place <laughs> after that? Do you mind talking about that for a little bit? Oh, sure. Well, that's because everything it was everything. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's what everything. I'm saying. I had to rethink everything. Yeah. So you know, I, I I immediately when when Jonathan told me the name of your podcast, I loved it. You know, rethinking God. <laughs> and here's the thing, you guys, we're going to be doing that forever yeah mm. however good you think he is you'll never he's get better. to the place where you go i've got it he's that right good. Yeah. no he'll yeah, always right. be better because he, he's <laughs> infinite in his being i can't tell you how many friends have told me like God, isn't it going to be boring who wants to live forever well no but if <laughs> life is like that forever yeah. a discovery in the ongoing moments that continue on age upon age without end of how wow. good he is and you never get there. That's like eating chocolate know. chip cookies and never getting yeah. diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. That, it's, it's, it's a lot better than that. So the metaphor that uh, helps me when I, when I look at this in my life, when you ask what, what changed, what were some other things that I had to rethink, I think of it like dominoes. When the first initial domino started to topple, it hit the next, and then things just started falling. Trinity and relationship were two of the first three. Um, the first one was realizing that I wasn't right because mm. that I was convinced I was right. So why would I ever yeah. look anywhere else for yeah. anything else? Right. But yeah, the I problem see. was that is that like you, Jason, I was convinced I was right, but I couldn't live in the reality that the theology I believed handed me. Yeah. The savior for me in those years of my life. And I have no doubt this is one of the reasons why God participated with me in becoming a nature photographer because out in nature i experienced beauty and knew in the deepest mm. part of my being right. that whoever made this is good yes. <laughs> even though my yes. theology is telling me ah, he may not be 
Yeah, yeah. Mm. Right? So all those times I would go into the wilderness and, and I'd be in solitude and I'd be in nature and experiencing this beauty, it was my lifeline. It was the thing yeah. mm. that yeah. they gave me yeah. to keep me from going off the edge yeah. and just chucking the whole thing and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with any of it. Because I, I, knew, I knew there was beauty and, and that meant there was goodness. And though I couldn't find it in my theology, I found it when I was walking in the mountains. Wow, yeah. so, isn't that amazing? So the domino of being right was the first one. It hit the Trinity, it hit relationship, and then it hit justice. I, I talk about this in the book. I remember going, doing my first, you'll get a kick out of this, Thomas, because this is before, like, I'm guessing maybe even before you were born. But there was a time back in the early 80s when personality tests were all the craze, Myers-Briggs, all that stuff, Yeah. right? Yeah. And I just refused to take them because I go to a party and everybody's talking about what they are. And I felt like an outsider. <laughs> I felt like it was like a creepy secret code, you know? Sure. <laughs> um, but I finally did. And it didn't really tell me, I mean, it told me some things I didn't know, but it confirmed that justice was like literally yep. the most important thing in the world to me. Like mm, right. I, I loved athletics. I love sports and I hated losing, but I hated you cheating more infinitely mm. more than losing to you. Right. You cheated yeah, me. Right, yeah. That was worth a fight. If you beat me, <laughs> yeah. I'm not happy, but if you cheat me, I'm going to punch you. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm exaggerating. Yeah, yeah. You get my point. So justice was huge. Justice is at the core of how I used to understand atonement, how mm, I used to understand sure. why Jesus wow. died. Yeah. And the way it was framed for me and still is for most people in our yeah. country. And by the way, we are the major exporters of that ideology yeah. in the world That's the true. last hundred years. Yeah. So yeah. it exists everywhere now. I'm not saying it's the most prevalent one, but it certainly is. We've exported it everywhere. Is, is that Jesus is dying to appease the yeah. wrath, the yeah. justice that God <laughs> demands. Yeah. And because the way we're defining justice is he has to punish the evildoer. Yeah. And there's so many problems with that. One, mm. since when does punishment ever reconcile anything? Mm -hmm. yeah. It literally <laughs> has no power to reconcile. And if salvation is reconciliation, then yeah. why punish? Because it has no yeah. power to do it. Mm, so um, secondly, not only can it not accomplish reconciliation, but if you say God is punishing, this means that there's something, and this is the real problem, there's something in the nature of God, somewhere deep in there, mm. yeah, 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 that has to do this that has to inflict yes. some yeah. kind of suffering yeah. on somebody <laughs> because he's not complete. He's not fulfilled. He's not yeah. appeased <laughs> until he yeah. does it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll mess you up. That'll to it totally messes me up, but yeah. it justifies why in my framework, <clears throat> well over 90% of the human race of all time would spend eternity in hell being tormented by God. Sure. Mm, well, yeah. we backed off from that and we said, well, no, God's not going to torment them, but he made the place so that they sure. would be tormented, even if they're tormenting right. themselves. And he's right. consigned them there. Uh, <laughs> according to my reform friends, he's chosen them to be there. Right. Age upon age. And not upon only, age. not only that, but he gets glory. I'm going to get in trouble yeah. anyways. No, he no, gets he gets glory from that. There because is, there is glory that comes. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, yeah. and the reason why is because this thing, justice, uh, they may yeah. talk holiness, but it's justice because yeah. he yeah. needs to be appeased and he gets yeah. satisfaction, which yeah. is how some yeah. people define propitiation. And I think you can use that word, even though that may not be the best word. I still think you can use it and not end up with this penal substitution sure. type of theory. Uh -huh. yeah. But anyway, that was, I was taught that so much and taught it so much that it was never even considered a theory. It was just considered yeah. the truth. Like yeah. this, is, yeah. this is what happened and this is why Jesus yeah. did this. And so when mm -hmm. I talk to people, again, I'd say this is one of the most common things I get when people start understanding what I'm trying to say. 
the question they'll say is, well, then why did Jesus die? Which yeah. means they're getting it. They're saying, you're saying that the reason I think Jesus had to die isn't valid anymore. Isn't. Right. Yeah. And I'm going, you got it. You're right. And then they yeah. go, so then why did he die? A very good friend of mine who's a pastor of his church, I love him to death. And he was very concerned that when his daughter spent a week with us talking about these things, she came <laughs> home and saying, Dad, I'm not sure I understand why Jesus died. That yeah. was cause for him to go, I sure. don't want anyone to ever have those conversations again. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, you know, that's all tied into justice. So the domino mm. of justice was huge. And that's where George comes in. George, his sermon in Unspoken Sermons on Justice is hands down the best thing I have ever read on justice. Mm. And I say that in my book, I, I say, look, I, I'm not going to beg you to forgive me or apologize for borrowing from him because <laughs> what he says is so awesome. And essentially yeah. what it comes down to you guys, and I don't know if you've read that sermon, but if you haven't, you need to. Um, and for me, I'll, I'll give you a little backstory here real quick. It was an amazing t time, a period of my life, because I was going through a very difficult time with someone very close to me, a betrayal of, of sorts. And not that I was blameless in it, but, but there was a betrayal. And as I'm going through this and my insides are just literally being ripped to shreds, my wife is so upset that she literally physically got sick for three days. And my wife doesn't have an wow. enemy in the world. Okay. Hmm. It's right then that I pick up George and I read justice. Because at that point in oh, my wow. life, what I wanted was justice. But the way I defined it was I wanted this person to be punished for what they had done to us. I wanted them mm -hmm. to feel yeah. the amount of pain and hurt that they had caused on us. I wanted yeah. eye for an eye, right? I wanted retributive justice. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and for me, justice, or actually the way I would have said it is punishment equals justice. Although if yes. you had punished right. this person, it wouldn't have reconciled us and it wouldn't have no. made me feel any better. Yeah. There might have been yeah. something dark in me that have got that had gotten some kind of pleasure, but that's a very dark place. That's a brokenness yeah. that, yeah, that's that, right. mm. that you know relishes in someone else's pain. Yeah, there's no. We have there. Word, yeah, we have words for that, right? That aren't good. Mm. So, yeah. um, George just walks you through this, and he says, "Look, in my version, what justice required was punishment." And George said, "No, what justice requires is for God to destroy it." Yeah. Justice will destroy sin, not punish it. He wants to destroy it. Good. Oh my gosh, that was like someone just flew the door open and went, oh my yeah. gosh. So I'm going through this emotionally, personally, and I'm reading this, and I'm not kidding you, there are times I would be kneeling because my wife would have been in bed already asleep, and I'm upstairs in my office and I'm reading this, and I come downstairs, I wake her up, I say, sweetheart, you gotta, you gotta hear this, and I start reading to her, and I'm weeping reading this to her, not just wow. because of the beauty of what I'm reading, but what it's doing the, in my the heart. The healing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it's converting yeah. my view of God yeah. and justice. So it's almost like God said, I know this is going to be hard, but I, I'm going to, you want to learn about justice because I know this is a big one. Yeah. And mm. I'm going to put you in the fire. Mm. Um, and again, I'm not to try and get uh, crazy biblical here, but in a sense, like, you know, the three Hebrews in Daniel, Shadrach, yeah. Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, you're going to go in a fire and it, uh, yeah. but I'm going to be in there with you. Yeah. Right. Mm. And yeah. when you come out of it, uh, mm. the fire is going to burn away all those crazy thoughts you had about my father. Wow. Here's, a, here's another quote from George. Good souls, many will one day be horrified at what they thought of God. Yeah. Mm. And that, <laughs> that was me. That was me. Yeah. Mm. So, so the, uh, you, when you asked me what else, uh, Thomas, justice was another big one. I, I feel like you, there are people listening where, where, where you said, why did Jesus die? Yeah. And I feel like you just answered it, but I'd love you to spend just a little bit longer. The way I would say it, and again, this is 
this is still learning and changing. Yeah, right? of course. I, I'm, yeah, of course. I'm understanding yeah. it more. I'm trying to find better ways to articulate it. I need to preface what I'm going to say with this. At the end of the day, it's a mystery. What we do know is it's that Jesus saves us. Yeah. Mm. We're not quite sure how he does it. We think it might be this way, but he saves us. When divinity, okay, unites to humanity in the person mm. of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. He doesn't unite to part of humanity. He unites to all of humanity. And all of yeah. humanity is in him. And I would say, uh, and I, I think the early church said this for centuries, actually, that what he unites himself to is Adam after the fall, not Adam before yeah. the fall. Yeah. yeah. Right? He, he unites yeah. himself, as John once says, he becomes flesh. Right? Yeah. And so... Yeah to fallen Adamic flesh. Uh, and here's where I, I sit at the feet of Baxter and say, thank you. Um, yeah. Cause he says this very clearly. He said, when that happens, that can't happen. Something has to give mm -hmm. either something gives in the, in the, in the, in the very nature of God or something gives in humanity because this can't happen. And what happens is there's a fundamental uh, conversion of humanity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the second Adam. So ultimately, Jesus dies because if he's going to heal the worst of us, he's got to get to the worst of us. Yes. And what is, is there anything worse than hating and then murdering God? Yeah. Could mm -hmm. there be anything yeah. worse than that? Hating and trying to kill and in fact, carrying it out, killing your maker, your creator. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And that's what we do. And he says, I will get to the bottom of all of your darkness, of all of your blindness, yes. I will heal it from the inside out because I have united myself to you, to yes. humanity, to the human nature. Yeah. Now it's a process of discovering that, yeah. walking in it, living in it, yeah. growing to trust him as what he's doing so that I can live out of the truth of who I really am. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> right mm. or as yeah. you know as richard Rohr would say instead of living out of ego or or the false self right right live out of the truth of my being salvation i i taught this all my life so i that's again i have to preface that salvation is i thought it was found in the death of jesus it's not mm. salvation is is in being united to jesus and yeah. that happens in the incarnation yeah the whole thing every everything about yeah. it and that's still good it culminates in his death because it has to he has to get to the bottom of our our blindness our darkness yeah. our, mm -hmm. our brokenness yeah and yeah. that ends up in his death and yeah, that's beautiful but he also has to conquer death so how does yeah. he do that well he climbs inside death and blows it up yeah he rises from the dead yeah. Right? Mm. <laughs> and then he, he and then he ascends and he takes Beautiful. all of humanity with him. Yes, all of humanity. All of humanity. There's <laughs> neither Greek or Jew, free, bond slave, whatever, doesn't matter. Male, female. Yes. This is another thing. Like in, in the former narrative, I realized that my view of why Jesus died was predicated in God being morally prejudiced toward people. That's really good. Yep. Yep. But my Bible tells me he doesn't show favoritism about to anyone for anything. There isn't one iota of prejudice in the yeah. triune God. So yeah. back to the relationship. So I used to think, and this is the way, again, that framework of why Jesus dies, that he's dying to take the punishment that we should get, that God has to give. He's appeasing God's nature, which he is God. Which, so he, he has a different nature toward this than his father. It, it just pre presents all kinds of problems. But yeah. Yeah. regardless of that, I would have had answers for those. They weren't very good answers, but I had answers for them. In, in relationship, I used to think that in that framework of penal substitution, the major issue of of humanity the problem of humanity is a moral or legal one mm. but it's not the yeah. major problem is a relational one That's yes That's moral good. and yes. legal well yeah they're there but 
that's the fruit yeah, of yeah, the I mean, relational yeah. baggage, the relational yeah. emptiness, the yeah. alienation of having yeah. walked away that yeah. I suffer from. Because I'm not just alienated from God, I'm alienated from my fellow human. Yeah, correct. Right? And I'm alienated from myself. Yeah, that's right. That's I right. don't know who I am. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So alienation that's right. is complete and total. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so the solution to that is reconciliation. It's a relational issue first and foremost. It always has been. Mm. But I never that's thought good. of it that way. I always thought of it as a moral or legal question or a moral legal. That's so issue. good. Mm. And it is. <laughs> so it is a moral legal issue if you're talking about well, God needs to punish he, because sure. What, sure. What ha- yeah. it's a moral issue for him. I don't like yeah. what you did. Yeah. I don't like the way you think. I don't like, no. For me, in my journey, the interesting thing about the moral and legal part is that that is a very Western way of actually viewing this. If, if, if you study any of, especially our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, the way they see this is not as not God as as judge having to come down in a court case, but God as healer, as yep. someone that's actually removing something from us that is keeping us from, as Jason was saying, our true identity or wholeness or, yeah. or healing. And so yeah. I, I, I'm with you on that, that it, it, it's just a complete, as you're talking and as you're saying these things, I, I remember when I started thinking about this and and just what are different streams of the faith saying outside right. of my evangelical right. charismatic? I, I was floored. I was like, I hope no one's listening to what I'm listening to, you know, <laughs> because it's, it is in many ways, it was like, I didn't even know this was an option. And, right. Right. and to, to be able to see, you know, I love what you're talking about with George McDonald as as destroying the actual, we had this guy called Mako Nagasawa who um, does a lot with restorative justice. He's out in Boston mm-hmm. and, and he's kind of an early church guy, but he talks about how the early church saw justice as God destroying sin, not destroying the person. There's a difference between personhood and the object he's trying to destroy yeah. that, that is keeping us from wholeness. Yep. And so that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, just it is beautiful. One of one of the issues, if salvation is primarily a moral or legal problem, and yeah. not a relational one, then what ends up happening is, for me, everything was external, and this is what drives the performance-driven life, right? You've got to perform, yeah. which yeah. is embedded in every religious system. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. That's right. You know, I, I was like, no, it's by grace through faith alone. You know, I'm w- with Martin Luther and all those guys. And, <laughs> and um, but this is, was part of my confession. I, I began to realize like, yeah, John, but you've just twisted it in such a way. You're better at covering up your performance driven system. Yeah. Mm, and yeah. Uh, because you think it's all about external. And so I say a lot of times this comes up a lot with young guys and it should come up with everybody uh how do you overcome say watching porn well my my friends would say you stop watching porn and i go but that doesn't overcome it what overcomes it is you don't want to watch porn that's good Mm. that's good it's not just not doing it it's you actually change on the inside so that you don't want to again it changes the conversation from behavior and performance and externals to, you know, like you said last night, Thomas, your inner world and what's, what's really going on. Because if Jesus doesn't save the one who wants to watch porn, then what am I going to be in heaven and just go like, well, I want to watch porn, but I'm sure glad I'm in a nice place. (laughs) There's no, there's no porn here. Maybe eventually, yeah, maybe eventually it'll go away. Yeah. No, Mm -hmm. it has to, it has to be changed. And he has done that. And so yeah. it's me living into it and beginning to trust and experience so that mm. uh, my way of being, and this is a phrase, again, that I think that Baxter was the first one that I heard say it, my way of being 
begins to match the truth of my being. Did Baxter share with you his story of the little girl and her grandma? I don't think he did. Mm -hmm. It's a great little story. You may have read this one because uh, I know you've read some of his books. He tells the story of his son when his son was young playing with a friend and they came in and they, they jumped on him and started having this kind of mock battle. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah. yeah. And what he's trying to illustrate there is in some way, um, his son's knowledge of his dad entered his son's friend so that his son's friend was <laughs> free to treat this man who's not his father. Yeah. Like he was. Yeah. And so Jesus knowledge of his father is what's yeah. changing us. And we get yes. to participate in that. That's so and, that is really it, good. It happens incrementally, slowly in the process yeah. of life. That's right. Right relationally it, yes. it happens relationally so and again i'm not I'm a, I'm a person who loves to teach but at the end of the day information is not going to solve this that's right Amen. it's going to have to be worked out in relationship with others that's, that's right. good that's right? good so that is good that's good well, that's... i know what we're calling this now <laughs> <laughs> this podcast thanks brother what are we oh. calling it well, it's going to have a relationship in it because it kept coming back to us. So it's going to be, as I edit it, I know that that'll be ultimately where we go because it is. That's the good news. Yeah. Is, well, thank you guys. Thank you very much for having me. This has me. been so great. This is, and we'd love to have you back on. I felt like, you know, there's so much oh, there. Thanks. So we'd love to continue the conversation. And I'd love that. Whenever um, you want, just let me know. We always like to ask the people we have on what, where we you can know, find you. Where we can find you. Well, I know you're having Brian Zond on next week, right? Yeah. Um, and you've had Brad and Paul and Baxter. Have you had Kenneth Tanner, Father Kenneth Tanner? No, we have not. He's cool. a great friend. Uh, you guys said you've seen some of the, what we call the table talks, the little 30 minute kind of panel discussions uh -huh. that we've had a yeah. bunch of us together. Um, and we're going to do that on a much larger scale. So we're actually going to do a, an open table conference and the whole thing will be online virtually and okay. you'll get to hear from all those people. There'll be panels, there'll be opportunity to talk. Uh, when it's all over, you'll get the entire thing recorded so you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, awesome. So that's something that I would really encourage to participate and they can find cool. out about that or me or a bunch of these guys opentableconference.com, uh, johnmcmurray.com. We'll put all that stuff on the podcast and, uh, we'll let you thanks. know too, when yeah. we put it up. Thanks so. for, thanks for being with us. So this oh, was really welcome. good. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Same you guys. And I, I just want to tell you, thank you, not just for having me, but thank you for doing this because, yeah. um, mm. I'm at a place in my life where I almost feel like if we're not going to talk about the love of God, I'm not sure I want to talk. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, I'd rather talk about something else or whatever, but, yeah. um, and, and you guys are attempting to have this conversation in a way where people can, can join in and participate and listen. That's cool. And yeah. uh, I thank you for doing that. That's yeah. awesome. Well, That's thank awesome. you. That means a lot. Yeah, it does so thank lot. you. Yep. Yeah. You're welcome. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode. We hope it encouraged. Uh, we had a lot of fun making it. If you guys want to subscribe to this podcast, please do. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of them. Anywhere you might listen and, to podcasts. And leave a review. Leave a review. Also, if you want to follow us on uh, social media, um, you can go uh, to, uh, I know this man has a Twitter account. Uh, we both do. Um, and if you want to find us uh, online, we're at afamilystory.org, afamilystory.org. Also, you can reach me there if you want to get a hold of us for any reason at uh, jason at afamilystory.org. We're excited that you guys are on this journey with us, and we look forward to releasing more content. Yep. Yeah, thanks. See you.